Our next topic is on compound interest. And while yes, there is a heck of a lot in this particular chapter, uh, you're going to find how the important topics for us are really going to be the interest rates and how to deal with them. Because for the topic after this, annuities, this is going to come into play quite a bit. Now there's a number of tutorials for this particular topic, so you should be working through these before our class after break week. So there's a basic introduction to compound interest, there's dealing with the periodic and nominal interest rate, effective interest rate, and equivalent interest rate. And we have an online assignment number five that is predominantly on interest rates, but there is a question in there on equivalent payments, looking at the future value and present value of compound interest. And we'll also do some uh, questions in class together when we get back from break week. As per normal, always remember your order of operations, always remember your rounding, and please, your best practice is to keep all decimals throughout the problem when using your calculator and only round at the very, very last calculation. Now we have two concepts, simple interest versus compound interest. And in simple interest, that's usually for, say, a loan or something that's for a very short period of time. And we can see here that the simple interest, the interest amount earned, is the same at the end of every period. The growth is linear. So if we drew a straight line here, we'd have a straight line here for linear growth, where we'd have the interest is the same each and every time. So here's the first interest, there's the second, adding the, another piece of interest, and you can see the little tiny pale green interest being added. Compound interest is typically when we're looking at loans or some, some type of situation where we have longer periods of time involved. And compound interest, the nice part about that is that the growth is exponential. So we don't have this same tiny little piece of green. You can see here that the interest donated by the green poxes is getting bigger and bigger each time. So compound interest is how things grow typically. So that is an exponential or for us it grows faster. If we take a look at a simple example for compound interest, we can see how if we had $1,000 at the beginning of the year and we are say earned $100 interest on it, at the end of the year, we would have $1,100. If we earned interest on that again, well, the interest is now gonna be on the 1100. So we're getting $110 of interest. So notice how the interest amount is changing. It's actually increasing because we're basically earning interest on the original amount, the 1000, plus the interest that was earned in the previous period. So the basic calculation here is we have our subsequent amount of money is equal to our present amount of money times one plus I, the periodic interest rate, and just keep going for the number of periods. And I have one, two, three, four, one plus I's here, indicating the one, two, three, four years in total. We have a formula from this then for the future value of a present value that is earning compound interest. We can abbreviate it as FV is equal to PV, future value is equal to present value, times one plus I raised to the exponent N, where N is the number of compounding periods. We can reverse that equation to calculate for the present value. And if we do that, present value will just be the future value times that same one plus I to the minus N. Now this one plus I term is commonly called the um, collecting term or the increasing term so that we can see here that when we're going into the future, the one plus I is raised to a positive power. When we're coming going to the past, so we're calculating present value, the one plus I is to a negative exponent. So this accumulating factor, it accumulates into the future and it depreciates via the minus n into the past. And if we wanted to know how to calculate just the interest amount, well, interest amount is just the future value minus the present value. And that would be the total interest across the entire period. We have a couple of symbols and concepts for these formulas that we need to get familiar with. We're gonna have term that's t, it's the number of years. We don't formally see it in these equations. 
We have a compound frequency m, so that's the number of times interest is compounded every year. We have the number of compounding periods is n, that's the total number of compounding periods in the term, so the n is going to be related to the m and the t. We have something called a nominal interest rate, and the symbol for that is j, and that g just means that it's the quoted, stated, or in name only interest rate quoted per year. The periodic interest rate, little i, is going to be our interest rate for the particular compounding period. And our periodic rate, we have a relationship, is equal to the nominal rate divided by the compounding frequency. So I have i here is equal to j over m. The total number of compounding periods is going to be n times m times, sorry, n is equal to m times t. So n, remember, is the number of compounding periods, m is the compounding frequency, and t is the number of years. So here it is in symbols, and here it is in words. Let's get a little bit of practice with our periodic rate. So we're going to use a nominal rate of 12% per annum. Okay, and we're going to determine all these different things. How would we write stuff if we had, say, a weekly compounding frequency, daily, quarterly, etc. So let's do the first one, the annual one first. So the symbol for nominal rate annual would be J1, because this is the number of compoundings per year is going to be 1, because it's only being accrued annually or once per year. The periodic rate would be 0.12 over 1 or 0.12 per year. And where did the 0.12 come from? Well, we were told that the nominal rate is 12%, so in decimal 0.12. What's the length of our compounding interval? Well, it's one year, or if you prefer, you can write it in 12 months. For semi-annual nominal rate, so now we're going to have two compoundings per year. So our symbol will be J2. Our periodic rate is now going to be that nominal rate, the 12%, but this time round divided by 2. Remember, 2 is the number of compounding periods, m, so that's where the 2 comes from. And that's just equal to 0.06 per SA. SA means semi-annually. And what is semi-annually? Well, it's every half year or every six months. Moving on to quarterly, we have four quarters in a year. So there's four compoundings per year. Symbol is J4. Periodic rate, so the periodic, the rate per quarter is going to be the 12% divided by the 4, or 03 per quarter. And then what's the length of the compounding interval? It's one quarter, and one quarter for a year is three months. So the 12 months divided by 4, or three months. Monthly, 12 months in a year. Symbol would be J12. Periodic rate would in this case be the nominal rate 12% divided by 12, which is 0.01 per month. And our length of compounding interval is one month. If we had weekly nominal rate, again, there would be 52 weeks in a year. And this would, you know, we wouldn't worry about the, um, you know, maybe a little bit more because of the 365 days and 364 days type of stuff. We'll just use the 52 per year. So J52 is the symbol, periodic rate is the 0.12 over 52, or double knot 23 with all the decimals. So this dot 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 means I'm using all the decimals that come after. And what's my compounding interval? It's one week or seven days. And then we could look at a daily compounding. So every day we would get interest. So there's 365 days each year. That would be the standard. J65 is the symbol for the nominal rate. The periodic rate per day would be the 12% divided by 365, which equals to double knot 32 with all the decimals per day. And our compounding interval is one day. Now, just as a word of recommendation, I always recommend to my students that when you're writing down your periodic rate, include the per year or per semi-annual, per quarter, per month, per week, per day, just so that you stay. Mm. Let's keep going. Let's calculate some rates here. So we want to calculate the periodic interest rate for 9% compounded monthly. 
So let's move over to our document camera so we can try this problem. So we want to calculate what is the periodic rate I when J is equal, J12 is equal to 9%. So we can write this as decimal 0 0.09. And remember, I then is just going to be the 0 0.09 divided by 12. And if we do that calculation, we'll get 0 0.0075, and that's going to be per month. Okay, let's go to the next example. Here we have it for a nominal interest rate of 8%, determine the compounding frequency if the periodic interest rate is 2%. So if we want to solve this problem, this time around we don't know the compounding frequency, but we know the nominal rate is 8%. So our m is unknown, and our given i is 2% or in decimal 0.02. So if we use the same type of analogy here, we have i 0 0.02 is equal to our nominal rate 0 0.08 divided by our m. So it implies that m is equal to 0 0.08 divided by 0 0.02, or m is equal to 4. So we know here that we are compounding quarterly. And we could always check that. We could go, OK, well, the nominal rate is 0 0.08. We divide that by 4, and we get the O2 as periodic. So we're good to go for that. Let's try our last one here. What's the nominal rate of interest if the periodic rate is 2.5% every six months? So let's give this one a try. So here we have our J semi-annual is unknown and our periodic rate was given as 2.5% every six months. Every six months means semi-annual. That's why we have semi-annual here. So our periodic rate in decimal is 025 per semi-annual. Semi-annual means that our M is 2. So let's put this in now. So we don't know what our J is, but our periodic rate 025 is equal to our J over 2. So our J is just going to be 2 times the 0 0.025. So we'll get J is equal to 0.05 or 5%. And really, we should be writing this symbol here. So our final answer would be J2 is 5%. Okay, so that's just a couple of little examples for working with interest rates. And you'll see in your assignments, you'll have the um, similar type questions. Okay, let's go back to our notes here. So those are the three examples we just worked through. Let's take a look <clears throat> at determining what the future value of $1,000 is. If it was invested for three years at an interest rate of 12% compounded annually. Now we are going to be introducing a, a new concept here, something called a timeline. So a timeline is how money moves in the financial industry. So here we have our annual rate, our J1, 10%. It's compounded annually. That's where the one comes from. Here's our timeline outlining what's happening. So there's our 10% compounded annually. Zero is our today value, or today time, I should say. Three years is into the future. And we want to know what's the future value of $1,000. So we put our $1,000 today, that's what we're investing, that is considered a present value. We're moving it, so this green line is our money movement line. It's moving into the future, and we want to know what the future value is. Now, it's good work habit to write down your periodic interest rate along your money movement line. Again, just to keep things a little easier for you to follow. So remember, periodic rate is the nominal rate divided by the compounded frequency. So we have here that my periodic rate is just the 0 0.10 per year. We also then have to calculate our n, so our number of years. So we have three years 
and our compounding frequency is once per year per year so it's just going to be three years. So we can add this in put it all together into our formula and we have a thousand present value one plus i one plus the point one zero n is three perform our calculator work and we get 1331 with all the decimals because this in month this is money we should be putting our answer as there for the future value is with the dollar symbol one comma three 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 one point zero zero so this is the pennies down here and this is the dollars here now i have included in the notes the time value of money functionality on the Texas BA2 plus calculator. Remember, it's not required for us in an online setting, but if you do happen to have it, you could enter these values into your calculator using our time value of money function, put in these values and you'll get the exact same answer. Let's try a couple other questions. What's the future value of $10,000 that's being invested for three years? And we're gonna do it three ways, compounded semi-annually, compounded quarterly, and compounded monthly, and all at 10%. So again, setting up our timeline, there's our J2, there's our zero to three years in the future, there's our $10,000 investment, there's our future value that we don't know, there's our periodic rate, the 10% divided by two, because our first example is semi-annually, two compounding periods per year, so 05 per semi-annual. And the number of compounding periods, the number of semi-annual periods in three years is the three years times two semi-annual periods per year, so three times two, six semi-annuals. Now, this is something you should be paying quite a bit of attention to, our periodic rate, and our n has to be for the same units. So per semi-annual and semi-annual compounding periods. If we don't have the same um, words here, then we've done something incorrect, okay? So please make sure you're keeping track of that. Plugging into our formula, we now have the 10,000 times one plus 0.05 raised to the sixth power. Trying that out, you get 13400.956. Remember dot 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 is all the decimals. And our final answer will round and add the dollar symbol $13,400.96. Okay. And again, there's for those of you who are interested in the Texas BA2 plus calculator time value of money functionality, these are the entry values we would put in. Now I do have a couple of other questions here. Uh, you can see that these are going to be calculating the uh, maturity value, which means the future value for a particular situation. Then we have 5,000 at an interest rate of 8% quarterly and five years later we make more contributions. How much are we gonna have? These questions we'll try together in class next week. Same thing for this one, investing the 5,000, etc. What's gonna happen? How much will we have by the end of the 10th year? We will do that in class together next week. All right, let's take a look at present value for compound interest. So present value, we're going to, what amount would we accept today for a payment of $1,000 that you were to receive in five years time if you can in earn 6% compounded annually. So this $1,000 is something we would get in five years. So we're looking at, okay, I don't wanna wait five years, I wanna get something today. What amount would that be? Now with money, we always have the concept that money grows into the future, otherwise we wouldn't do any investments. So if we're gonna have a thousand in the future, well then we should be accepting something slightly less today because then bringing money from the future into the past, it will be lesser. So let's take a look at setting up the timeline for this. There's our J1 compounding annually 6%. There's our timeline zero to five years. This time round, our money movement line though is moving from the future to the past. So $1,000 in the future is equivalent to what amount today? Same procedure 
calculate your I, your periodic rate, 06 over 1, because we had compounded annually, so 06 per year. The number of compounding periods is just five years, so we have the five years. Remember the formula for present value is the same as the future value one, but the power on the one plus i is negative n. And now we have future value in front of the factor. We put in our numbers, 1,000 times one plus 0 0.06 to the negative five. Try that out on our calculators, keeping all the decimals, 747, 258, et cetera. And then rounding our final answer, our present value that we would accept today is $747.26. So we're saying here that rather than wait five years and get $1,000, I'd be willing to today accept $747.26, so a bit less, because these two amounts would be equivalent considering that the interest rate would be 6% annually. Again, if you want to do the time value of money on your calculator, there's the information to enter. Okay. Now, one of the things that you have to recognize when we're doing the present value is that since we're accepting money today, we're receiving money, so our future value is negative, okay? just to make the calculator work out. For your calculator, you have an N button, that's your number of compounding periods. Your IY is your interest rate per year. You enter it as a percent directly, not converted as a decimal. We have the number of compounding periods, so we have to hit our second and the arrow down to get our PYCYs. And we get our present value, payment, and future value. Again, we're not responsible because of in this online situation, but the, for those of you who um, want to work through some things, you can use this and refer to your textbook. There's some cash flow sign conventions that for different transactions, if we have <clears throat> a present value, if we're making an investment, we're investing money, so it's coming out of our pocket, so it's considered an outflow. In the future, we would be getting money back, so that would be considered an inflow or positive. In the case of a loan, if we're having a loan, that means we've gone to an institution and they're giving us money, so that's an inflow positive. And in the future, we have to pay back that loan, so it's an outflow or negative. And here we have the summary up top. Let's take a look at some questions for compound interest. So what amount would you need to invest now in order to accumulate $10,000 after five years if you can earn 4% compounded quarterly? So here we go. There's our quarterly rate, our J4, 4%. Now we want to know what we would need to invest now in order to accumulate. So accumulate means that's the future amount. So our timeline is zero to five years. And we're going to accumulate $10,000, but how much do we need to put away now? So again, notice our money movement line is going to the past. Periodic rate is just the 04 over four or 0.01 per quarter. The number of quarterly compounding periods is five years. There's four quarters per year. Five times four, 20 quarters. So we have quarters for our periodic rate and quarters for our number of compounding periods. We're able to go ahead. There's our formula again. Plug our numbers in. Do our calculations. Do our appropriate rounding. So our present value, what we would have to invest today is $8,195.44. And again, here's the TVM. Let's keep going. <clears throat> here's another problem. If we owe $3,000 in six months time, how much should you pay now if you can earn interest at the rate of 3% compounded monthly? So let's see what we're going to do. So this amount, the 3000, we owe it in six months. So it's not right now. We want to know, okay, I want to maybe pay it off a little early. 
So I want to pay it today versus waiting six months. What would that payment have to be? So there's our monthly nominal rate, J12, 3%. Here's our today. There's the six months in the future. Now the $3,000 is in the future. So that's what I owe. But I want to know if I wanted to pay that amount. But today, what amount would I have to pay? And again, because the future is coming into the past, this $3,000 should be a little bit less today. Follow our same procedure, periodic rate, 03 over 12, 12 because of the compounding monthly, double not 25 per month. And then how many months? Well, we're told it's six months. Using our formula, plugging in the values, trying the calculator work, and then rounding to two decimal places for the pennies. So today we would only have to pay $2,955.39. And there's our TVM once again. And notice here, since we would be paying today, we're giving money away, so the future value is positive. Here's an example that you can try on your own and bring it to class with you next time and we'll compare answers. There's also some other questions that we could do. We have the two payments, we have a single payment, and then we have a third one for equivalent payments. How would we solve this? Okay, so we'll look at all these questions next week, but maybe see if you can actually give them a try and go from there. There's one more you can try. There's a further one. And now let's move on to our I and J formulas. Now here we have the equation with our four variables, future value, present value, our periodic rate, and our number of compounding periods. And remember N is M times T. If we wanna actually rearrange this to try to calculate some other values, well, let's do the first thing. Let's divide through each side by the present value. Let's then get rid of the exponent by raising each side of our equation to one over n. The left-hand side would stay future value over present value to the one over n. And the right-hand side, well, the rules of exponents, n times one over n is one. So we will be just left with one plus i. And if we wanted to calculate i, we could again then have the future value over present value to the one over n minus one. So if we needed to calculate or wanted to calculate our periodic rate, we could use this particular formula. If we wanted the actual nominal rate, we'd need one more step. And we'd have to remember that i is equal to j over m. So that just means that the nominal rate is jm will be i times m. Okay. Let's do a couple of examples here <clears throat> where we're doing the calculations. We want the periodic and nominal rates for the following examples. So we have four of them that we're going to do. We'll do them on the next slide one by one. So you can notice we have different present and future values. We have the time period that's due and we have our conversion frequency or our number of periods per year, okay? And we want the i and the j. So let's take a look at our first one. We had that the present value was 1,050. The future value was 1,900. And we had three years and we have a compounding annual frequency. Remember, we'd have to do the future value over the present value. So 1,900 over 1050. We had one over n number of compounding periods, and it's compounded annually, so that's just going to be three. So it'd be one over three, and then we subtract one from this entire calculation. So you do that in cal calculation, subtract one, and remember your periodic rate would then be the 218 with all the decimals per year. And if I wanted the actual nominal rate, remember the nominal rate, we need the periodic rate times the number of compounding frequencies. So it's just 0.21 times one, or in percentages, 
0.86%. And again, here's the TVM if you are interested in looking how to do it there. Let's try the next one. We had a different present and future value. This time we had 12 years we were looking at and the compounding period was semi-annually. Plugging it into our formula, there's our future value over present value. The one over n, well here we're going to have one over 12 times two. And remember why 12 times two? Because n is the number of compounding periods in your entire term. Two compounding periods per year times 12 years, we'd have 24 there. Plug it into your calculator, we'd get 035 with all the decimals per semi-annual this time round. And to get the nominal rate, we'd have to take that periodic rate with all the decimals, multiply by two, and get 708%. Now you should be trying these calculations. Um, you know, pause the video if you want and try the calculations to ensure that you can get these same answers, okay? Here's our third example. Present value 2300, future value 5450. This time round our term is four years and nine months and our compounding is quarterly. Using our formula, the future value over the present value, here now we need the one over, now <clears throat> we have 57 divided by three. And if you're wondering where the 57 came from, well, there's four years, 12 months per year, 12 times four is 48. So that's 48 months plus nine months. That's 48 plus nine is 57 months. And how many months are in a quarter? Three. So 57 divided by three would be our quarters. Okay, so please make sure you're paying attention to this N calculation. Once we have that though, we plug everything in. We get 046 with the decimals per quarter to change to the nominal rate. We have to take the 046 with all its decimals and multiply by four. So the J4 would be 18.58%. And again, there's the TV, TVM. Let's take a look at our last example, present value 800, future value 1225, term is three years, eight months, and we're compounding monthly. Plugging into the formula, future value divided by present value, one over 44 months, where'd the 44 months come from? Well, three years in months is three times 12 is 36 months, 36 plus eight, is 44 months. So there's the 44 months, okay? Plug this into your calculator, double knot 973 with all the decimals per month. And then to convert to the nominal rate, <clears throat> this should be J12, pardon me, my little error here. It's not J1, it should be J12. It's hidden, I think, behind the, uh, the yellow. So the 0.973 times 12 would be 1168%. So please just take note that this is a little error here. This should be J12, not J1. And again, there's our TVM. And you can see here I have J12 correctly written. So just again, that's J12, not J1. Yes. 
Am I looking at the wrong file or what? Let's take a look now at um, figuring out the T instead of just the N. So for each of these examples, let's take our further it. So let's start with the one, the quarterly rate. Now you'll notice here that I'm using the decimal answer with all the decimals. I'm not using the rounded answer, okay? So that's quarters. So I divide it by four quarters per year. So that's 16.36 years. Now, if I want the answer, say, in a different unit, I could say, well, that's 16 years plus the 0.36 with all the decimal years times 12 months. And that would be 16 years plus 4.37 with all the decimal months. And my final answer, I could round it as 16 years, five months. So there's different ways that we can, you know, give our T. We could just give it as a decimal year and possibly round it if we wanted, or we could go into the months. But please, again, use your unrounded value. Let's take a look here. If we wanted to give this same answer, so the 16 years and 0.36 years, if we wanted to make that in quarters, we could go 16 years times the, or excuse me, 16 years plus the 1.456 quarters, so the three, six times the four, and then that would be wind up coming out to 16 years and two quarters. So, you know, we could give it as years, we could give, give it as years and months, we could give it as years and quarters, multiple ways we can give our answers. So let's be careful here. So remember, don't round your N first, only round the final calculation. Let's take a look at the Last example here, the 21.12 semi-annuals. And let's take a look here. We've got um, the 21.12 with all the decimal semi-annuals. There's two semi-annuals per year. So that's 10.56 years. Again, maybe we wanna change that to months. So that's 10 years plus 0.56 years, change it to months, 12 months times 12 months. So that would be 16 years plus 6.73 with all the decimal months or 16 years and again rounding up seven months. Let's keep going. Let's calculate something called an effective interest rate. Now an effective interest rate has a special symbol called F and it's just the annually compounding interest rate. Okay. 
And it's good to know the effective interest rate because when we are in different financial institutions, people might quote it differently. So if we want to have a good comparison, it's always best to convert them all to the effective rate and then to be able to say, okay, well, this one's a better rate than another institution, okay? So the effective interest rate is going to result in the same future value as whatever nominal rate with a given compounding frequency. Two methods we can use to do this. Our first method is sort of a conceptual method. And it says that our new rate has to be our old rate. And we can think of it like this. Our new rate is one plus the new periodic rate raised to its compounding period is equal to one plus the old periodic rate to its compounding period. And we'll see some examples of that. There's actually a textbook formula that you could use and it has the symbol F. F is equal to 1 plus i to the m minus 1. And it's important to note that F is just a different way of writing J1. So effective interest rate is just saying it's a J1. Okay. So we're going to have three examples that we're going to look through. We wanted to calculate the effective rate for these following examples. And again, remember, we have two methods. We will do both methods for each of them. And F is also can be written as J1. So let's try our first example. We have a semi-annual compounded rate of 5%. Let's use the conceptual method that our new rate is equal to the old rate. So our J1 is unknown. Our old rate is J2 is 5% or O5. So new, 1 plus I over 1, Y over 1, because we want a J1 and then we raise it to its compounding period once per year. Old rate, 1 plus 05 is the old rate. It's a semi-annual rate, so over 02, and its compounding period is twice per year. We do some simplification. 1 plus i to the 1 is 1.025 all squared. We can then do some rearranging as far as exponents. 1 plus i is 1.025 raised to the 2 over 1. Now this is a little redundant in this case because we don't technically have to divide here using our rules of exponents, but we'll see in a future example how that's going to be important to understand that whatever compounding exponent was here is going to have to show up over here. We can then isolate i by subtracting 1 from each side, and here we'll get 0506 rounded to four decimal places per year. If I wanted to use my J, then I can say that J1 is 0506 in percentage times the 100% or 506 percent. If I wanted to use my actual formula, the F, I could say that the F, remember that's just J1, and remember the F formula is 1 plus I to the M minus 1. So 1 plus 05 over 2 all squared minus 1 506 percent. And we do have functionality on the TVM calculator. We could also follow this procedure to get the same answer. Let's try our next example. We have a quarterly rate of three and a half percent. We'll do the concept method first again. So our J1 or our F is unknown. Our J4 is 035. So same as before, 1 plus i over 1 to the 1, 1 plus 035 over 4 to the 4. Simplification, calculate what's in the brackets here. That's 1 double naught 875, all raised to the 4, 1 plus i to the 1. Do the simplification again to get rid of this exponent, divide through or raise each side to the 1 over that. So this is going to be 1, and this will be 4 over 1. Isolate your i. We need to do this to the 4 over 1. I'll subtract 1. And we get 03546. And again, per year, we put those words in there because it's a periodic rate. Converting to a J1 then, as a percentage, we just take that decimal, multiply it by 100%, and get we get 3.55%. Again, using the actual F formula, plug in all our values and we get the exact same answers. And then last but not least, the TVM calculator. 
let's do our last example here. We have a monthly compounded rate. Our nominal rate is 9%. Concept method again, new is equal to old. Our J1 is unknown. Our monthly compounded rate is 9%. So we notice here we have the 09 over 12 and the entire bracket raised to the 12th. The left hand side is the same as before. Simplify the brackets. That comes out to 1.0075 raised to the 12th. Do our rules of exponents. So you have the 12 over 1 here. Isolate your i. Do your calculation. And we get 093806 per year. So our J1 in percentage is going to be 0938 times 100% or 9.38%. Okay? Remember, we're not just looking for the periodic interest rate here. We're looking for the F or J1 rate, the equivalent, the um, effective interest rate. Using our F formula, again, we get the 9.38 exactly. And then we have our TVM. Now it's important to be able to convert different rates to effective rates, but then also sometimes what we're going to do or want to do is to calculate what we call equivalent interest rates. Okay. So equivalent interest rates are just going to be those nominal rates again, the J, but they're going to have different compounding periods. So instead of a J1, now we're going to have a J2 or a J4 or a J12. Okay, so we want to know what's the equivalent, say, to a J2 of 5%. What's the equivalent rate as a J4? Okay, we want to know it in that period, in that um, notation. We're going to have the same conceptual method. New is equal to old again. And here again, we're going to have the different compounding for the different periodic rates. There's a textbook formula we have, and they call the I2 is equal to 1 plus I1 raised to the power M1 over M2 minus 1. Now, I find that a little confusing for myself because I might can say that I2 is my new rate. You might say I1 is my new rate. So we have maybe some communication issues around that. For myself, I like to write it like this. My new periodic rate is going to equal to 1 plus my old periodic rate to all that raised to the power, the compounding period for the old rate divided by the compounding period for the new rate, and then all of this subtract 1. Okay, it might look a little confusing right now, but it does get uh, pretty clear when we're doing some examples. So let's calculate the equivalent interest rates for these three examples. We have a J2 and we want a J4. Then we have a J4 and we want a J12. And then we have a J4 and we want a J2. Okay. So we're not looking for the F or the J1 in this case. We're looking for an equivalent interest rate for a different compounding period. All right. Here's our first example. We have a semi-annual nominal rate of 6.5%. Let's walk through our methodology. New is equal to old. So J4 is what we want. J2 is what we have. For the J4, we're going to have 1 plus i raised to the fourth is equal to 1 plus the i raised to the 2. Now we have the 065 over 2 here because that is the periodic rate for this corresponding J2. We do the simplification. We get 1.0325. We need to now deal with the exponents. To get rid of the exponent here, we have to raise this whole side to the 1 over 4, which means we have to raise that whole side to the 1 over 4. Here, the exponent goes away, so we're left with 1 plus i. On this side, we're left with the what's in the brackets, 10325 to the 2 over 4 by the rules of exponents. We can then isolate for i and do our calculation, and we'll get our periodic rate of 0161, etc., per quarter. And if we want the nominal rate, we're going to have the periodic rate times 4, so our J4 will be 6.45. 
Now, if you wanted to use the actual formula from the textbook, the I2, and remember two is considered the new one. So our I new one, and that's going to be per quarter, because that's what we were looking for, is one plus the O6 size over two. The old compounding period was the two. The new compounding period was the four. So there's our two over four, and then subtract one. Do that calculation, you'll still get the 0161 with all the decimals, and to convert it into a J4, multiply it by four, and now we have the 6.45%. If you're using the TVM, it's a two-fold process where you take your original, original um, nominal rate, you convert it to an effective rate, and then you take that effective rate and convert it to the new desired nominal rate. Okay, But again, for us, we can do the longhand, either the concept or the actual formula. Our second example, our nominal rate is J4 is 6.5%, so 6.5% compounded quarterly. We want a J12, so a compounded monthly one. So there's our 1 plus i to the 12th. Our old rate, 1 plus 0 0.065 over 4 raised to the fourth, simplify inside the brackets, get rid of the exponent. So we're going to have the 4 over 12 here, isolate the i, do your calculation, and then convert the periodic rate per month to the J12, the nominal rate, 6.47%. Again, using the formula, 1 plus the old rate, 0.065 over 4, old comping, compounding, compounding period over the new compounding period, all subtract one, and then that would give us the monthly periodic rate. Don't forget to get the nominal rate. You then have to multiply that answer by 12, and we get the same answer. And again, we have our TVM from our calculator. Let's try our last example. We have our J12 is what we want, our semi-annual nominal rate. We have a quarterly nominal rate. So again, using the new is equal to old. The old is 1 plus 085 divided by 4 because of the quarterly compounding, all raised to the fourth. We do our simplification. We get rid of our exponent. We isolate our i. And we do our calculation to get the periodic rate. We then convert the periodic rate to the nominal rate by multiplying by 2, 8.59%. Conversely, we can use our textbook formula, the new quarterly rate. Remember, this sorry, this should be the new semi-annual rate, not per quarter here. Again, my apologies for the errors in this. We have 1 plus 0.065 over 2 raised to the 2 over 4. OK, let's start this one again. So we have J4. Our quarterly compounded rate is 8.5%. <clears throat> we want to know what the J2 is, so the semi-annual compounded rate. So again, using our concept new is equal to old, 1 plus i2 to the square, because of the J2, is 1 plus the i, the given or the old, 085 divided by 4 to the 4. Simplifying in the brackets, 085 divided by 4 plus 1 is the 1.02125. Using our rules of exponents, we now have the 1 plus i all by itself is equal to 1.02125 to the 4 over 2. Our i is the 1.02125 to the 4 over 2, all subtract 1, and we get And we get 0.04295 per semi-annual. If we want to convert that to the J2 as requested, we need to now multiply that 04295, etc., times 2. We get 8.59%. We could use our formula, I2 or I new. So our I per semi-annual, because that's what we wanted, is the 105 
one plus the 085 divided by four, old compounding period four, new compounding period two, all that calculation, subtract one. Again, we get the 0429 per semi-annual. To change it to the nominal rate, we need to multiply it by two and we get the 8.59. And again, we have our TVM. So for important issue for this um, chapter is being able to do some calculations for future and present value for compound interest, but more importantly, to deal with different interest rates, because that's what we're going to be spending a lot of time on in annuities. So just a reminder, you have the four online tutorials to go through for this, plus your assignment number five.